Mission Boston was the code name assigned to the operation that would carry the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division to Normandy. It would bring 6,420 men. It would consist of 370 C-47 Skytrain troop carrier transports. And the division was assigned effectively two objectives. One of them was to liberate the city of St. Miraglis. The other one was to seize a series of strategically important river crossing sites. And one of those river crossing sites is directly behind me. This is the Mer de Ray River, and that is Lafayette. This place was elevated in importance during the first three days of the Normandy invasion. And this place was the first battle that the 82nd Airborne Division would fight during the Normandy invasion. The 82nd had been Alvin York's unit back during the First World War. They were a fairly storied unit. The 101st was, was new to this game. For many years, a lot of the 82nd story was reflected in the scenes of The Longest Day. But actually, uh, Band of Brothers, uh, HBO's monumental series, kind of shifted that spotlight from the 82nd, from The Longest Day to the 101st of the Band of Brothers. The neat thing is, is that they all served. They were all heroes. The American paratroopers who jumped into France on the early morning hours of June 6, 1944, they were different. These were men that had volunteered. Uh, parachuting, guys do it a lot now, but it was a fairly new thing and, and fairly dangerous. They had an esprit de corps that some of the other infantry units just simply didn't have. And the thing about being a paratrooper is you knew there was a good chance that you would be surrounded. Uh, you would be jumping into unfamiliar terrain. Uh, into enemy territory, behind enemy lines. And there's a, a certain mindset that comes when you know that just about everyone around you is going to be the enemy. Around 1 a.m. on D-Day, a single C-47 Skytrain troop carrier aircraft flew directly over downtown St. Mariglis, dropping paratroopers. They were men from the mortar section of F Company, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division and they weren't supposed to be here. They were supposed to be about a mile that way on the 505th drop zone. But the aircraft dropped them too late. They missed the drop zone. They landed here in St. Mary Lee's. One of the men with the mortar section was Sergeant John Ray from Gretna, Louisiana. And Ray landed right about here, injured upon landing. And while he was still struggling to get out of his parachute and to free himself from his parachute harness, German soldier walked around the corner just over there, chambered around in a K-98 carbine, and shot Ray in the stomach. Ray was still alive, though. That German soldier walked past him and saw, hanging from the roof of the narthex of the church, a paratrooper by the name of Ken Russell. Russell was hanging there helplessly as the German soldier chambered around and began to raise the carbine to fire another shot. But before he could do so, John Ray drew his M1911A1 45 caliber self-loading pistol and fired seven rounds that killed the German soldier and saved Ken Russell's life. John Ray didn't die here. He survived on, ultimately succumbing to his wounds. He actually died of gangrene the following week. But it's impossible to visit St. Mary's today without pausing for a moment at the spot where his future was condemned by a shot from a German Car 98K carbine and where he also saved the life of a fellow paratrooper. This memorial remembers the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment. It fought during the Normandy campaign as a part of the 82nd Airborne Division. 2,002 members of the 507th Parachute Infantry jumped into Normandy during the pre-dawn hours of D-Day. And by the time that the regiment was removed from combat the following month, 303 men had been killed. One of the men from the 507th that was killed here in Normandy was from C Company. His name was Joe Gandara. And Joe Gandara was a machine gunner operating the Browning M1919A4. He lost his life very close to this memorial during the afternoon of June 9th, during the big battle to capture Coquigny. 
and Gandhara was last seen alive, carrying his M1919 with the barrel shroud laying across the crook of his arm as he charged toward a German machine gun position. He ran right up on that position and killed the German gunners carrying his 1919A4 machine gun. Gandhara was then dropped by a rifle shot from a German rifleman nearby and his life came to an end. In the aftermath of the Normandy campaign, Gandhara was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and his family was very proud of that. But then in 2015, his award for the Distinguished Service Cross was upgraded to the Medal of Honor. When it came to the German army in Normandy, the firepower really came from the light machine gun or general purpose machine gun. And that's the MG34 or the MG42, even though you do see examples of other guns. So the Germans, especially early in the, the campaign on D-Day itself, were fighting a defensive battle. Uh, they didn't know where the enemy was necessarily, in particular with the airborne behind them, uh, with the troops coming ashore. So th there, there was confusion. If you were in a defensive position, as the Germans were on D-Day, the belt feed and quick barrel change meant you could keep up sustained fire for quite a long time if you weren't flanked. During the pre-dawn attack of the 1st Battalion, 325th Glider Infantry Regiment on June 9th, the men had to move up the railroad line leading to Cherbourg, down the Roman road, move through an orchard, and then they were to sweep through their hedgerows and outflank German positions at Coquigny. But the attack didn't go well. They were met by intense German opposition with the result that elements of the 1st Battalion, 325th Glider Infantry, some were stopped, some moved forward, but some didn't move as quickly as they were supposed to. As dawn began to break, one squad from C Company, 325th Glider Infantry, maneuvered across hedgerows in that direction crossed the road leading into Coquigny, barely 300 meters away that way. They moved through this gate and entered this field. As soon as they did so, they came under machine gun fire from the building just behind me. The men were immediately pinned down in this field by the German machine gun, and they had no hope of withdrawing safely, and that's because to do so would require them to move through this gate, exposing themselves to German bullets. And there they would have remained until Private Charles N. de Glopper stepped forward and opened fire with the Model 1918 A2 Browning automatic rifle. De Glopper stood in the middle of the street and began directing BAR fire toward that window, suppressing the German machine gun. And as he did so, the men stranded in the field withdrew through the cattle gate and across the road to safety. When de Glopper finished the first magazine, he began to change it to a second when bullets from the German machine gun struck him and knocked him to the ground. He then steadied himself, rose to his feet, picked up the BAR, shouldered it, and fired the second magazine. As he did that, more of his comrades withdrew to safety. He still wasn't sure that everyone was out, apparently, because he began changing the second mag to a third mag. And as he did so, more automatic fire from this machine gun struck him, and this time killed him. De Glopper laid in the middle of the road, dead, but every man withdrew to safety, and every one of those men survived the Second World War. In the aftermath of the Normandy campaign, Charles de Glopper was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. And until 2015, his was the only award for the Medal of Honor for the 82nd Airborne Division for Normandy.